Are you recording? Excellent. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Koletsky, and I'm the director of the Temple Museum of Jewish Art, Religion, and Culture. And we're so glad that we're all together today. Um, this is our eighth Zoom Art Talk of the year, and I want to thank Cindy, uh, can't Candy, rather, for sending out our Zoom information. And of course, Jen Mendelson, the Director of Operations at the Temple, for hosting this Zoom. And also for all of you being together here today. Our talks are informal, and that's the whole point of it. So if you have something that you want to join in with or say, please either write it in the chat or raise your hand, and we'll kind of um, go towards you. Um, so the order, or, or I guess the Seder of today's program is going to be that I'll be talking a little bit about the pieces in our collection that are Haggadot, and then Rabbi Cohen will talk about the new CCAR Passover Haggadah, and then Margie will talk about her delightful and fabulous family heirloom book about Passover, and then we will look at some of the Haggadot that you are bringing to this session. So let me first ask, does anyone have any uh, Haggadot that they plan on sharing with us today? One, anybody else? Okay, all right, well, we'll have time, I'm sure. That's, that's very important to us. So, um, so we're getting ready for Passover, the festival of spring, the festival of matzah, and the time of our freedom. And certainly once we all have our second vaccine, we will feel that freedom is on our plate and we'll be happy, very happy about that. Um, so as we know, getting ready for Passover means many things from cleaning our homes to possibly changing our dishes, cooking special meals, trading new recipes with family and friends and getting ready for the Seder itself, including the Seder plate and bringing out the family Haggadah, Haggadah uh, for everyone to read. And some, in some families, they have to pick which ones because over the years they've collected many, many, and uh, it's a fun thing to be able to do that. Um, so the Haggadah tells the story, and of course we discuss and uh, study and sing while we're telling the story and transmitting it to the children. And it's the story of the redemption of the people of Israel from Egyptian bondage. So each year we tell the story and join the family with our friends at the, um, at the Seder. The Passover Haggadah is a major Jewish text um, in the sense that there are so many of them. The first was printed in, 19, in 1482, and there are over 5,000 different Haggadot. Some are beautifully and magnificently illustrated, and some are just straight text. Many of you are very familiar with the Maxwell House Haggadah, which has uh, been published, uh, and there are and many, many, many copies of those, I think 50,000. And most of that there is text. Um, as we know, there are many um, sites that can even help you create your own family Haggadah if you want to and uh, bring in the uh, poems and prayers um, and uh, readings that you want to uh, incorporate for your own family. The Haggadah is read, sung, and shared at our seders. So the Temple Museum has over 50 different Haggadot in the collection. Today, we'll look at some that are especially beautiful, and we will see that they are all extremely different in style, depending on the artist who illustrated the Haggadah and where and when the Haggadah was created. So let's look at the first one together. Jen, we can put up the first slide. Okay, we can go, perfect. The first Haggadah that we're going to look at is called the Sarajevo Haggadah. This beautiful facsimile was donated by the Bob, by Bobby and James Rich family. And this is a facsimile, um, a very um, beautiful one. This Haggadah has a fabulous history as well as beautiful illustrations. Um, we can go to the second slide while I tell you some of the history. You can look at some of the pictures. The book belonged to a family, the Cohen family, in Sephardic Sarajevo in 1894. The family needed to sell it, and it became the possession of the new Bosnian National Museum. Because of its beauty, it began to be studied in Vienna, and it was also um, very exciting to see this because the belief was that there were, were not Hebrew 
illuminated manuscripts in medieval times. So this was an amazing find. Then when the Nazis occupied Sarajevo in April 1941, they immediately went to the museum to confiscate it because it was so famous and so valuable. But the museum librarian and the director, Darius Korfut, smuggled it beforehand and hid it in a Muslim village where it was hidden in a mosque. Then in 1992, the Haggadah survived the Bosnian War. And then many of you probably have read The People of the Book by Geraldine Brooks. And she writes about this Haggadah and it's a fabulous story. If you haven't read the book, um, I certainly recommend it. So the bottom line is that it was created in um, Barcelona. It was created in Barcelona around 1350. It's handwritten on bleached calfskin and it's illustrated with copper and gold. There are 34 pages with scenes from the Bible from the creation to the death of Moses. So this is also a bit unusual, not for the time, but that they would have the entire illustrated Bible in the front. So let's look at this. And this is the first few pages of the, um, of the Sarajevo Haggadah. So the left uh, scene is the creation scene. So you can see it's divided into four. And on the right is the spirit of God kind of hovering over the primeval waters. And then to the left of that is the creation of light. And then if you go down to the right again underneath, it's the creation of the filament. And then to the left, it's the creation of vegetation. So this is very abstract and, you know, really, I think, incredibly striking. The, um, another page is from the um, plagues. So the top is uh, the plague of hail. And you can see the way that it's illustrated. There's all the white dots of hail. And then the trees are actually kind of battered and underneath it are um, people and animals that are sheltered. And then underneath that are the locusts and that's the eighth plague. And you can see that again, the, um, the way that people are dressed and the way that they are uh, positioned are in a very kind of Gothic flat uh, dimension. Okay, we can go to the next one. So on the left is um, a few more uh, illustrations from the Bible itself. And there's the crossing of the Red Sea at the top and at the and the parting of the Red Sea. And the bottom has Miriam and her timbrels. And again, the way that the artist um, portray this is, is very um, unusual in the sense it's not super static. You can feel that the women are actually moving and holding hands and dancing. Uh, the colors are, are beautiful, the, the um, deep azure blue and the uh, intense crimson paint. And then at the top, you can see that there are, the crown actually is uh, gilt, gold, gold gilt. So um, on the right, it's, we go into the pages of the Haggadah. And that pretty much is written um, without too many illustrations. I picked a page that had more illustrations than not. Um, it's mostly text. The strokes are very broad and very beautiful, upright forms. And then at the bottom, there are decorations. So you see that there are like there's a kind of a person with almost a long tail. They're very typical of medieval manuscripts. And then on the left hand is the, um, the horseradish, the bitter herbs. And it's a very large bitter herb. So these are some illustrations from the Sarajevo Haggadah. Okay, let's move on to the Shik Haggadah. So the Zhik Haggadah um, is, this is a, a facsimile actually that was donated. Um, it's more of a, um, 
a, re, a, a reproduced one um, because there's so much demand for these Vesja Kagata. This one was donated by um, the Vidal family. And um, Arthur Zik is a Polish Jewish artist who was born in 1894. And after 1940, he settled in the United States. He's the artist who designed our memorial windows in the chapel in the alcove outside of um, the chapel. He died in 1951. Now, this remarkable Haggadah is magnificently illustrated and contains a contemporary meaning of the text. And it was created between 1934 and 1936. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the temple owns a very rare copy of the limited edition of this Haggadah also. So the one that I showed the cover of was more the trades Haggadah. And then we also have one that's very, very special that was printed on parchment by the Beaconsfield Press in England. There were only 250 volumes printed, 125 in England for sale and 125 in the United States. They each cost $520, and that at the time was the price of a small car. The Temple Men's Association, the Temple Men's Club at that time, purchased this precious volume, which was signed by Arthur Schick and has a dedication page, and they bought it in honor of Rabbi Abihilo Silver. Now, this Haggadah is currently on exhibit in the Temple Gallery at the Maltz Museum. As you can see, Maltz. As, as you can see, Zhik has a very specifically densely decorated style with a vivid palette. His craftsmanship as an illustrator is beyond amazing. Yes, there are 48 yes. full pages um, that are watercolor yeah. and gouache. Um, so let's look at this. On um, Somebody's not muted. Yes, hold on, it's my husband. Wait a second. Rich? <laughs> All right, um, on the left side, um, we can see the page where there's actually the artist. And you can see at the bottom, there's Arthur Zick um, as an artist, and then his name is signed. So this is the front page. And then on the right, um, we can see the Seder. And um, when we look at it carefully, you can see all sorts of, you know, wonderful uh, remnant, uh, pieces of the Seder. So there's um, the Seder plate that has all the ritual food, the pillows that people are resting on. There are wine cups for everyone. There's one of the boys is reading Haggadah. Of course, there are children. And everyone's leading leaning on their sides. There's, um, and everyone seems to be very dressed for the holiday. The colors are magnificent and the details are extraordinary. Okay, let's go to the next one. Thank you, Jen. So the next one on the left is We Were Slaves. And so what we see in this top illustration is um, the Jews who are slaves and they're doing you know, menial work. I mean, it's quite beautiful, but they're doing art and they're in chains and above it are the Egyptians. And with Zhik, there was um, a lot of times he had these medallions kind of uh, that people were wearing. And um, in many cases, uh, he had painted very small swastikas in them but before these were printed, he took all, all of them out. Um, but um, many of you might've heard Irvin Unger speak. He's an authority on the on Zik, And he uh, pointed out where some of these uh, Nazi symbols were uh, kind of hidden in, his illustra in Zik's illustration. So you can also see at the bottom, um, there is Moses, and um, to the right of Moses is Aaron. And then Moses has the rod that turned into the serpent. And then we have the Egyptians. Um, on the right side, this is how Zhik portrayed the uh, four sons or four types of people. 
In this case, he really uh, had them all in European, um, uh, you know, uh, garb. And one son is the, on the right top, is like the student of Torah, the wise son. The simple son is the one that's down to the left on the bottom, who's kind of wearing uh, clothes in which he was uh, a workman. The uh, one to the right of that is the Jew that does not know how to ask, and he's dressed in just simple clothes. Um, and then at um, the top left is the wicked son, um, and he's dressed as a prosperous Jewish man who's totally assimilated into German society. The way that Zschick designs his pages are also just so beautiful. Like the first Haggadah that we saw is very block-like and Zschick divides his uh, page in a, um, a very structured way, very decorative. Okay, let's look at the Ben Shan Haggadah. Okay, so our third one is the Ben Shan Haggadah, and this was donated to the Temple Collection by Charles and Carol Rosenblatt. And Ben Shan was born in Lithuania and he came to America. He's very well known for his social realism. He was born in 1898 and died in 1969. And many of the illustrations for this Haggadah were actually begun in 1930 but they were amassed together and collected in 1965 and put together in this very beautiful and large um, Haggadah. There are only 292 copies of this specific edition and um, they're all printed on beautiful vellum. Um, this is number 174 of the edition and it was printed in Paris. And again, we have a very imp important um, Haggadah in the collection, um, one of just very few of an addition. So the struggle of oppression, which is central to the Passover story is also very important in the theme of uh, Ben Shan's artwork and his life work. So let's look at the next one, please. Okay, so this is the frontispiece. And then the other one is um, the bread of affliction. And you can see how the way he uses his page is very different than the way Zhik does. So he has a gigantic border over uh, around that surrounds the text. The text is very concise and beautifully uh, written. And then around this piece, you can see at the top, the um, pyramids and you can see the matzah um, and it's again, beautifully uh, illustrated with watercolors. Okay, the next one, please. And the last Haggadah that I wanna show you from our collection is called the Moss Haggadah. And um, he calls it My Haggadah, the Book of Freedom. David ba Moss was born in Dayton, Ohio, and he moved to California and then to Israel in 1983. He's currently working in Israel and we are familiar with his work because we have three volumes, Tradition, Transition and Transformation that are in the Temple Collection and are a collection of his beautiful Ketubot. Um, and that collection was given to us by Susie and Rabbi Block. And one of those pieces, one of those volumes is at the Malt Museum in our gallery and two of them are in our current exhibition uh, current wedding exhibition. So if you wanna see those, they are there when we go back to the synagogue. Um, so the idea for this Haggadah was proposed by Richard Levy in 1980 and um, he commissioned it. So one person commissioned uh, this artist to create a beautiful Haggadah. Um, he started it in 1980 and it took him three years to do this. Um, we have what's called a trade edition so it's not a limited edition like the other ones, um, but he does have a, um, a limited edition of 500. Um, again, we don't have one of those for our collection yet. So he has um, a fascinating web page if you wanna look at his web page. So let's look at that first inside. So he opens his agata with um, a tree image. So if you look on the right, you'll see that there are 
if you look carefully, you can see that there are seven branches, just like a menorah of the tree. And there are beautiful flowers. And then at the bottom, there are three more branches, which are roots. Um, so he was inspired by a medieval Haggadah and the symbol for the Torah, of course, which is a tree. And it's a metaphor for growth and potential. And that especially is in the spring. So um, if you look very carefully, he also um, is a master in mycography, which is a Jewish tradition of very small print. And it's usually done in beautiful decorative designs. So what he's done here all around this page is he has interlaced two lines and every single word from the Haggadah is in there. So he really has told the story that is going to be told. It's amazing. Okay, let's go to our next one. So this one is, um, he uses another fabulous Jewish tradition of art, the paper cut. And this piece is referenced from the Bird's Head Haggadah, the medieval piece from Germany. So the Jews, uh, the church rather, forced the Jews at that time to wear pointed hats or Jews hats. And you can see that in the right illustration, there are these pointed hats. And um, the Haggadah, the heads were replaced with birds. So Hebrew says, the merry singing birds were suddenly trapped behind prison bars of a terrifying cage. So what happens is this piece literally is a paper cut in the book and you flip the paper cut down over these um, bird head people. And then he depicted the doors of the, um, of the cage with the famous gates of Auschwitz with the words, um, work makes us free. So if you see that on the left, you can see that. And he says, and I quote him, my juxtaposition of the earliest illuminated German Haggadah with the gates of Auschwitz represented for me the beginning and the tragic end of the entire Jewish civilization. And he also hopes that his um, Haggadah is for everyone to uh, look at and enjoy, you know, enjoy being together to read and retell the story. And the last image of his, and of course there are many, many more, Jen, we can go to the last one, is of um, Hallelujah. And it's from the Hallel. And um, you can see Hall Hallelujah is written at the bottom in beautiful calligraphy. And it looks like the negative space, there is a wine cup. And um, the wine cup makes, uh, the, you know, the beautiful large calligraphy of the word Hall Hallelujah is at the bottom of the page. And we um, pour the fourth cup of wine before, and then after we read the Hallel, we drink the fourth cup of wine. So um, these are just a glimpse of some of the beautiful Haggadot that we have. We can come back to me for a second. These are just a glimpse of some of the beautiful Haggadot that we have and I want to um, wanted to share with you. And now I would like Rabbi Cohen to tell us about uh, one of our newest trade books that is in our collection. Thank you so much. What what a wonderful uh, what a wonderful introduction um, to. Um, okay, uh, are, am I back? Yes. Okay. Good. You're back. So what a wonderful what a wonderful introduction to to uh, what it is that we're going to be talking about today, and this is the most recent Haggadah that has come into my possession. I have my own little collection of Haggadot. We have about four dozen. And, um, and you know, we, we are, uh, we're obviously always excited with the new Haggadah that comes up. And I want to share with you a little bit of information about the new Haggadah that was just produced by the Central Conference of American Rabbis. And it's called Mishkan HaSeder. It is called the Mishkan, if you like, the sanctuary of the Seder. And this is the book and we've just received it. So a few words about the Haggadot and about this Haggadah in context. Uh, as many of you know, traditional Haggadot uh, 
offered art, those that were illuminated, created artwork all the way from the Middle Ages. We talked about the Sarajevo Haggadah and the Ashkenazi Haggadot that were produced, the German Haggadot that were produced starting in the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. And we only have 15th centuries, 14th and 15th century Haggadot left um, but that are illuminated. But we have these Agadot that are illuminated and that are often illuminated with figures. Now, as you know, one of the elements that are so special about the Sarajevo Haggadah is that it actually has illuminations, it has decorations that, that show human beings, human faces. Now, you know that according to the Ten Commandments, and according to our tradition, we were not allowed to have pictures and images, right, within our tradition. And what we see here is a real difference, a real distinction between the way this prohibition was interpreted in the Sfadi world, in Sfarad, in Spain, in Barcelona, as opposed to Ashkenaz, wherein you see illuminated manuscripts from the same period that also include humanoid type characters, but very often with beaks or with paws. In other words, with distinctive marks that render them inhuman. And part of the magic of the Haggadot has been Haggadot offering us art that is both realistic and fantasy that both reflects history and memory, and on the other hand, fantasy. And among the most interesting things about these Haggadot is that they offer us a window into the time and the culture in which they were produced, as we just saw. And what was beautiful about this presentation by Sue was that we were looking at Sarajevo, the Sarajevo Haggadah, a medieval Haggadah, as opposed to also modern Haggadot and the way we understand and see modern Haggadot. Well, Mishkan HaSeder, this CCAR Haggadah, is a departure for us. And it's a fascinating departure for, for us. And it's a fascinating departure for us in the sense that it offers us a glimpse into a contemporary interpretation of the Haggadah in the context of uh, modern art, contemporary art, but not only modern and contemporary art, also abstract art. So the artist who was commissioned to produce this Haggadah by the CCAR is a woman by the name of Toby Khan, the artist Toby Khan. And Toby Khan is, uh, is, is really a, a, an extraordinary artist. And, uh, and, and part of what was done here, part of what was produced here in the context of this particular Haggadah is the kind of artwork that I wanna share with you for a moment, if I can share the screen. Uh, I think I can, but, but if I can, I'd like to, I'd like to offer you a sense of, of, of these particular Haggadot and see whether I can, um, let me see if I can share this with you here. Um, no, I don't know whether I can share it with you. Um, I checked chair screen, so you should be able to do it. Thank you. Let me see if I can do that. Um, so I'd like to share with you some, let me see. Here, let me try. This, can you see this? Yes. Uh, so this, for example, is an illustration that is an abstract illustration, but that represents the 10 plagues. So you can see now, you can understand why this represents the 10 plagues. And this is part of what I want to show you here, because what we're clearly seeing is a human type figure, but a very abstract figure. And you can see the kind of art that's being created here by Toby Khan. The, the art that is uh, very abstract and yet quite visible, the entire uh, uh, Haggadah set is made out of these kinds of pieces of art that reflect lines, shapes in red, 
and blue-green tones that are separated by white and gray tones. The entire Haggadah is set along these color lines. And I want us to see how evocative these kinds of artwork, how evocative this artwork is in terms of, of what is being presented here by, by Toby Khan. I think, I think it really is uh, quite extraordinary what, what is being done here. Let me offer one more example and see whether I can, I can share one more example. Let me see whether, whether I can share this. Uh, do you see this? Do you see what, what I'm, I'm sharing with you right now? This no. is... I yeah? think you have to take down the first one. Oh, I see. And then replace it. Um, okay. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. This, for example, is the Karpas. This is the image of the Karpas. Now, if you see on the left-hand side, you see a green shoot emerging right out, which represents the green shoots of spring. Yes, in, certainly in my interpretation of it. But again, everything here is quite abstract and very evocative. And I want us to see this. I want us to understand that this is part of what Khan is trying to produce here. Uh, and, uh, and, and I want us to see that this is particularly interesting. Now, it's also interesting because this kind of attitude towards the Haggadah is not only reflected in the artwork, in these examples of the artwork, and I'm going to stop the sharing for a moment, but it is also reflected in the text of the Haggadah. And I want to share with you what happens, for example, when we come to telling the story of the Haggadah. Now, some of you recall that the telling of the story starts with the notion of our ancestors, our foremothers and forefathers, having been uh, non-Hebrew, non-Israelite, non-Jewish, uh, and pra pra practitioners of idolatry. And it really, in a sense, goes back to this pre-Jewish time, pre-Israelite time. And this is how the Haggadah starts telling its story. Well, here, you know, there are poems interspersed into the Haggadah. And let me read to you a snippet of one of the poems so that you understand what I'm expressing here in terms of uh, the kind of artistic endeavor that this Haggadah tries to communicate. I'm going to read to you part of a poem that starts the Magid, that starts the telling of our story. It's called Astronauts. Tucked into the top bunk you call heaven, your sister fast asleep on earth. You wait for those final moments before the day's gates close. You hurl your most pressing questions into the dark. When did time start? Where is everything that died? One night, you said, if dad and I had just been astronauts, we would have understood everything, as if all the mysteries of living would be perfectly clear, if only we could get enough distance. Right? I think this is extraordinarily moving. This is a poem by Judy Katz, and it was produced in 1959. And it is here right at the beginning of the Magid. And I can, I can show this to you right on the screen. This is the page that I'm pointing to that you, can, that you can look at for yourselves when you look at this Haggadah. But what I'm suggesting here is that the entire Haggadah offers us a window into the Haggadah text as an exercise in abstraction. Abstract art, the notion of bringing back memory, the notion of lines as we understand them, lines, colors, mixing, shapes, forms that are meant to evoke not to offer us some kind of a realistic view, 
not to just focus on the text, but to focus upon where the text is carrying us to, where the text might be leading us. And I'd like to suggest to you that in this respect, this particular CCAR Haggadah, Mishkan HaSeder, really leads us on a different path, on a different experience of the Passover, one that in many ways evokes the Sarajevo Haggadah, evokes the Haggadahs of Germany, evokes the Haggadahs of days gone by, but seeks to lead us onto memory, onto imagination, onto a notion of the past, onto some form of reconstruction and onto an exercise that at the end of the day is an exercise of time travel. It is an exercise not only of the evocation of memory and the imagination, but it is an exercise of us seeing ourselves within that memory and within that evocation, within that imagination. So what we have here in the context of this Haggadah is an extraordinarily ambitious effort. And I recommend this Haggadah to you. Its translations are beautiful. As I think you see, its artwork is beautiful. And the poetry that it incorporates is beautiful, and I am deeply impressed with it. And I'm delighted, Sue, with your invitation to offer a few words about this today. So thank you so much for this, for this invitation. Thank you so much, Rabbi. That was so interesting. And um, I have a copy here as well. I got one for the, another copy for the temple, but it is absolutely beautiful. So uh, I encourage people to uh, get online. You can get it very easily if you want it for your own collection. Um, thank you for that insight. So beautiful. And it does evoke the Sarajevo Haggadah with its abstractions. Really interesting. Um, Margie, can you uh, share with us your um, family heirlooms? I think I need Jennifer to get both me on and my little PowerPoint. So. She's there. She's there, okay. One second. Hold on. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Jennifer, can you get the image, uh, my image back or not? Oh, it just disappeared on my phone. I can, every, can everyone see this? I have the PowerPoint up. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. I, I disappeared on my phone, though. I don't know why. OK. So I can go on without being seen, which is fine. Do you want me to stop sharing? Well. OK, I'll stop oh, sharing. No, now I'm back on. Are you able to just show me on the side? So I'm looking at people or not? Um, or I, okay, there we go. Okay, there you are. There I and am. And I'm, I'm going to okay. share. Good. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I want to say that if, if 20 years ago, I wasn't really thinking about an heirloom, but I was thinking about how much I loved Passover and what a rich holiday it is with storytelling, passing on values, uh, Jewish values and the experiential celebration of food and wine. It was definitely my introduction to wine. Um, and at that time, I didn't have any grandchildren. My kids had, both of my children were married in 2000, but I started this in 2001. And, um, and I also, and I'm sure many of you feel this way, that I get re-inspired every year by this holiday, somewhat based just on the times that we're living in. 
Um, in fact, this year I'm thinking about how Mitzrayim means both Egypt and being in the narrow places, which is where we've been this past year. So I wanted to capture something about it. Um, also, because every year there's different guests, sometimes it's in different cities. I, um, I, I would do some years what I call my Seder Roadshow and bring almost all the food to Brooklyn, where we would have a big Seder with people of different uh, religions and races. Um, and so uh, also different world events. So I bought a blank book. You can put the book, you can move the book over, I think. Uh, Jennifer, you could go to the next slide. Okay, no, go back, go, we passed it. Yeah, that's what, that's it. So I just bought a booklet. Um, maybe you can see now, it's really big, but I still, I, I haven't used all the pages. And it happened to have had a clear cover and I put on the first page, uh, something I must have found in a book I had of a Delft Seder plate. And I just thought I'll keep a journal every year. And what I put in it was um, I had every guest sign in. I would take, always take some photos. And then I would include things. I wouldn't write anything down during, during the Seder, but, it, but it went, while I could still remember it freshly, within a few days, I would write down a few things like um, re special readings world events, the Seder menu, uh, in terms of maybe who sang the four questions, who found the Afi Komen, what was the prize of the Afi Komen, and funny moments uh, that happened during it. So let's move on to the next one, which is just a picture of one of my Seder tables. It has a lot of stuff on it. I always have a tambourine for Miriam besides the cup, and I have a lot of frogs all over the table. You can go on to the next slide. So that was my my first grandchild who's now 16, finding the Afi Komen and my late husband. You can go on. Uh, this also, uh, at the time, the granddaughters were living in Cleveland. And so I managed to have many, many years of them making pictures of them making matzo balls or corrosis. And the grandson on the bottom left is just adding salt, salt water, salt to the water. So the kids were really involved. And I will say that they, they love seeing this book every year. I think, you know, their whole lives are so digital that, that to have a real book to look at and see how they've changed over the years. Next slide, please. That's just showing people who signed in one year. Um, one year we had Lois Lane, the model of Superman's Lois Lane was at my Seder table. That was kind of exciting. And so that is Alice when she's three making matzo balls. Next slide. Okay, this is just a sample where I would put world events every, what was going on every year, tragedy in Darfur. It was usually bad stuff, but not always. Um, Margie, we can't see the slides. You can't? No. no. You haven't seen any of them? Yes. A few, a few. Look, I can Not, see everything. We saw I, everything till the last, the one before last. I saw them all. Okay. Oh. I, I can see them, them all. It must be individual computers because everything is showing on our end. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So. It, sometimes it was funny moments, years, yeah. and there on this one, there's a funny moment when um, um, the the little kids who were like three and four saw the picture of Elijah in the, in this Haggadah, which is the one that we use. Yeah, the, with the Baskin drawings, and they got really terrified that Elijah was coming to our house, and they were under the table crying. And my daughter said, you got to do something, mom. And so at that time, I had a flip cell phone and I called Elijah and I said, I know you have a lot of houses to go to, so it's okay if you don't make it here tonight. And when, then, then the kids like stopped crying and we started the Seder. But so I, you know, just some things like that. In fact, I have a note here. When we read about the wicked son, two and a half year old Elio asked if wicked people were coming to our Seder. So just things that happen, you know? Um, 
Next one, please. So we also would try to dress up sometimes, not always. It's very easy to turn any, I hope you're seeing this, it's easy to turn any guest into Moses. You just need a towel and something to wrap around the head. And that's my son, Mark. It looked very Moses to me. Next one, please. And so that is Edie as, uh, as Miriam, just wearing something that I had as a shirt with something wrapped around her. Next one, please. Okay, so we also had Egyptian, uh, you know, the I forgot the exact name of the kind of hat the Egyptians wore in the right, and the kids wore that at the Seder. Uh, on the left is Alice with matzo balls. The right, those masks were an Afikoman prize. Just says, who are these kids? And then the next one, which might be the last one, I think. The next one is just showing what was served. I think this was from a Seder in, um, in New York. So you can, you can go back to where I'm at. The, that's the end of those slides. I just want to say a few more things quickly. Um, so we also would do, you know, and I'm sure many of you do this, you add readings, even though the Haggadah has got plenty of readings, there's always certain ones you want to include. And uh, wait, wait, just one second. Okay. Um, and so um, I, I made a, I made a uh, PDF of five readings that I always like to include. If anybody wants them, I can send them to you. Just put your email in the chat. They include one about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which you probably know began on the first night of, of Pesach, um, 1943. It was April 19th. We always read from Langston Hughes. Um, and so I have a poem about his, Keep Your Hand on the Plow, and No One Knew When Freedom Would Come. And I have uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg on, on how we have to honor all of the women themes in the Seder. And I also have um, one about the crypto Jews, like how did you make your matzah? It's by a Yiddish poet. It's a really beautiful reading. And you know, how did you know what date it was? And what did you do for Haggadah? And it was hidden in a crevice, part of it in the basement. And, and, uh, and the last one we read is one um, that my husband wrote, who was kind of an artist poet as well. Um, a couple other things is that we do a lot with music. I still have a box of those kind of instruments you had when your grandkids and kids were really little. So we jam to Dayenu and uh, I usually play guitar, but we sing a lot. We also sing a lot of songs um, toward the end. As far as the Afikoman, um, there was one year when the kids decided they wanted to hide it and they wanted the adults to find it. Um, and also, uh, we, I would come up with prizes for everyone, no matter who found it. But then I started giving them money with the idea that they were to donate Sadaka out of um, a portion of it, a half of it, to something that they really cared about, like a you know animal shelter or a, a food pantry, something like that. So that is that is it. But you know what I wanted, and so if anybody wanted any of those readings, happy to put your email in the chat. But I'm going to just end with the reading my husband wrote because I think it's a different take. He said to me one year, you know, I go through the whole seder and I'm not sure I'm getting the essence of it. So I'm going to try to write a little poem about the essence. And he wrote, Passover is about the leaf from last year still clinging to the branch and the crocus nosing up in an instant of sun. It is the celebration of beginnings, but the recognition of endings. It is the memory of experience and the experience of memory. The shank bone and the egg, the fermented grape and the sprouted parsley, death, birth, slavery, freedom the recognition of opposites, finitude and timelessness, and finally the union of opposites in an order, a Seder. So that is, <laughs> I, I wanted to share that with you. I, have, I used to send that out. I have friends all over the country who read this, included in their Seder. So that is all. I hope, to, I hope that some of you, you know, especially people maybe who have new grandchildren, um, will think about doing something to create, and now I do feel it is an heirloom, though I didn't begin with that idea. But thank you, thank you for listening.
Thank you, Margie. That was so special and uh, inspirational in so many ways. I mean, it inspires us to write a lot of these things down that are so meaningful to us and also to share with each other some of our um, beautiful uh, poems and the one by David was so beautiful and uh, share these things together. Um, I wanna just see if who, who has a Haggadah that they want to share. And then if we have time, which I hope we do, there are some questions. So um, I have two people with their hands up. So Maude, what would you like to ask? Can you unmute? You have to unmute. Thank you. I have none in my apartment at the moment. Okay. My kids have them all. Okay. Did you have a question? Your hand was yeah. up. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. You. Want to... Oh well. No. I was writing a chat to Margie. <laughs> she can, maybe Margie phone. can hear you. Okay. That's good. Then we'll see it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Maya, Sorry. did you have uh, something that you wanted to say? Yeah, I want. I'm not sure I can show you, but I have here a page, and it's from the Golden Haggadah. And the Golden Haggadah was apparently from Barcelona, and it was written around 1320. And I don't know if I can show you, but it's, it's really illuminated manuscripts that are really gorgeous. And uh, I have here not the Golden Haggadah, but something uh, from the British Library the explanations and the history of it, but uh, I'm sure it's a beautiful piece. And the other one, this belongs to Judy Gerblich, and I snatched it away from her because I thought it's too nice. And it's from Dartmouth from 17 something, a Haggadah, and it's a facsimile that uh, the original is in Jerusalem, I believe. So these are the two Haggadahs that I wanted to show you. Thank you. Those are beautiful. Um, and I, I'm glad you shared those with us. And then also, I think that Flo has one that she wants to share us share with us. Flo, are you there? Okay. Um, I just want to start off by saying Passover is my favorite holiday. And I don't have a real beautiful Haggadah, like some of the other artistic ones that, I, that um, I've seen this afternoon. But um, it brought that, I always have these Haggadahs that my three daughters made when they were, went to Gannon Gill. And they are now almost 52, 51, and 45. But um, when my husband was here, we always had a fabulous Seder every year. And he made it so much fun. So I miss that terribly, but I have these agatas that I always put on the table. They just have the four questions in them. And as the grandchildren came along, um, we, uh, they read the four questions from these little Haggadahs that uh, our daughters made when they were in preschool. And it, they just provoke a lot of happy memories. Wonderful. So they're there. <laughs> Those That's are great. very meaningful Haggadahs. It yes. reminds me too that at Temple, we had our kids make um, matzah covers and we have all those matzah covers on our uh, table when we have uh, our Seder. And it again, always uh, reminds us of our beautiful past. So Amy, you yeah. have a question. Oh, Sue, that brings some, uh, you know, I have matzah covers that the kids made in, in my Passover drawer too. That brings back some more memories. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Good. Thank you so much. Those are wonderful. Amy, do you have a question? You have to unmute it. You're muted. I thought I had unmuted. Um, collective question. When you have a wonderful assortment of Haggadahs, has anyone come up with a good way of using multiple Haggadahs during your one Seder uh, to, that will avoid confusion, but will share the diversity? I think you could always copy something you particularly love in one Haggadah 
you know, and then as an insert that you either pass around everyone or you share, it seems kind of complicated to be juggling, juggling different Haggadahs at the actual Seder. I, but I have, well, uh, when my daughter and son-in-law took over the Seder, what they did was they took our Haggadahs that we used ever since they were little and my son-in-law's Haggadah and they combined those two and they wrote in some of their own things. So we now have a special Haggadah that the children, that family has created out of the ones that they grew up with. So it's all the same. That's a great, that's a great mm -hmm. thing to do. So you could write your own and combine it from different. Mm -hmm. Right, nice. and everybody's, everybody's Haggadah is there. And it's always fun. It's always fun to do. I think there's a way, I think it is www.haggadah.com and it helps you to kind of formulate your own personal family Haggadah. That's, a, that's great. Great question, Amy. Did you have another question for the rabbi about Elijah? Rabbi Cohen, are you still there? I am. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, good to see you. Um, I think Amy had asked, could you tell us a little bit about the role of Elijah? Is that what you wanted to know? Now, why is he so important in the Seder? Right, right. So, you know, the Seder actually, the, we know about the ritual that occurred around the Passover going back to biblical times. We know that there were rituals that were associated with sacrifice in the temple and so on and so forth. In other words, there was some ritual going back to biblical times. But the Haggadah is rabbinic. In other words, the, the Haggadah, and we know there was a Haggadah already in the second, third century to the common era. In other words, in the classical period of, of rabbinic literature at the very infancy of rabbinic Judaism, there already was some kind of a Haggadah. We have evidence of a Haggadah already early on. But the Haggadah that we use is medieval. It's basically it's a medieval text. It incorporates some much older texts. It incorporates biblical and early rabbinic texts. But the Haggadah that we use is really a product of the High Middle Ages. And in the High Middle Ages, one of the issues that arises for the Jews is the notion of redemption. Remember that the Jews are a small minority that the Jews are separated out and spread over the diaspora, mm -hmm. and that the Jews are weak. And they're asking themselves the question, when and how it is that they are going to be redeemed, and that they're going to be seen as equal and liberated. And I think that uh, Elijah, who is the only biblical character whose death is not recorded because Elijah is thought to be to ascend to heaven uh, in a chariot of fire. Uh, so there's never a record of Elijah's death. Elijah comes to be understood in rabbinic literature as the announcer, the messenger of the messianic age and of redemption. And what happens here in this period of the Middle Ages is that Elijah's announcement of redemption becomes increasingly important as a religious trope. And it makes its way into the Haggadah. And, and here, I, I want you to also know, and I'm only going to say this briefly, though I could speak about this for much longer, um, remember the coincidence of the Passover with Easter and remember that the notion of redemption is seen very differently by the Christian majority in Ashkenaz, in Europe, wherein Jews live. And here, the personality, the figure of Elijah becomes all the more significant. Okay, so this is the reason for which Elijah is, is so prominent in the Passover Seder. Thank you. Well, we are 
at the end of our hour of our Zoom art talk. I'm so glad we were together and I want to wish you all a happy Passover. I know it's not for a little bit more, but we're starting to think about it already. And, you know, I know we're all thinking about whether we're going to really be with our family or if it's going to be Zoom again or however we're going to put this together. But I wish you all the best Passover and um, health. Thank you so much to all. Same Thank to you. all. Thank you all. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you. you, Margie. Thank you it so much. Lovely, it was a lovely hour. And this was Margie. Wonderful. Thank you, Sue. Excellent. Thank you. I enjoyed it.